Okay, well, good morning everybody. This is the TC PBRF team here, and welcome to our second webinar, Creating an EP. We've got quite a few of you here this morning, um, about 30 at the moment. So welcome and well done um, navigating the technology again. We've got a beautiful day here in Wellington. I'm not sure what it's like around the rest of the country. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding, it's horrendous here. <clears throat> okay. First of all, um, introductions. Uh, so Sharon here, the communications and support person for the team. We've also got Amber Flynn, our program manager and resident expert. And we've got Blair Whiteman from KPMG, who will talk about anything related to audit stuff. <clears throat> okay, the format, um, same as the last webinar, if, if you attended. So we'll go through slides and expand on key points, answer some commonly asked questions. Um, your mics are muted, so, which is we need to do, obviously, with this number of people. If you want to ask a question, submit it by clicking on the question mark, the little green icon on the control panel. So we may take a while to get to your question, or we may decide that it's better answered offline, just depending on the nature of the question and the volume of uh, questions we get. But um, be rest assured that we will answer and, and publish all the questions on our Google information site. It took us a couple of days to get those all up last time, so but they'll be there. <clears throat> okay, just a little disclaimer. Um, so this is not a an exact iteration of the guidelines. We're giving advice of a general nature. If you do want specific determinations or advice, please contact us um, through our help desk or give us a call. Um, technical matters. We will be recording this. Um, so it'll be recorded anyway, hopefully all goes according to plan, but if it doesn't, um, some, something happens with our technology, we will, there'll be a recorded version up anyway. All right, moving on. <clears throat> the purpose of our webinar today, so it's to clarify the guidelines, to go over any complex or ambiguous points, um, to make some connections between help you connect the parts of the evidence, putting together the evidence portfolio, to highlight areas that are of particular significance. We know there's a lot in the guidelines, so we really want to pull out those important things, um, to give you an opportunity to ask any questions, and just to um, hopefully build confidence in the sector. <clears throat> um, we said this last time, and I'll just say it again, we do have a broad audience with us today, which is great, so a wide range of PBRF experience out there. So, so please do bear with us if you feel that the presentation is not pitched exactly at your level of knowledge or experience. And just remember, we're always there on the phone or via email for your questions. Okay, so what we're going to cover today. <clears throat> the overview of an EP, changes since last time, choosing the panel, the right panel, the contextual summary, research outputs, research contributions, extraordinary circumstances, and then there'll be time for questions. All right, moving on then. What are the basic bits? <clears throat> All right, so the information about the researcher and the information about the panel, those come first. The research outputs, the nominated research outputs, or the NROs, and the other research outputs, the OROs, research contributions and extraordinary circumstances. <clears throat> okay, here's a picture, and you've probably seen it. It's in the TEO guidelines. They're just giving you a little bit of a visual representation of what goes into an EP. So the blue things you have to do, and the brown, beige, puce, call it what you like, we couldn't decide. <laughs> Those are the optional ones. <clears throat> okay. Changes. Changes. So what has changed since the last round and why? So those of you who attended our last webinar, which is about staff eligibility, you'll remember that we just talked about the ones that were relevant to that and we're going to do that today as well. So we're just discussing changes here related to evidence portfolio, the develop, the assessment of EPs and just touch on any changes to assessments which are relevant to the development of them. <clears throat> All right, and to talk through our changes we have Miss Amber Flynn. <laughs> 
Okay, so um, I think probably uh, just to, to do a little bit of an introduction, um, it's good to remember that the Ministry of Education, they reviewed the PBRF in 2013 <coughs> and then Cabinet made a number of decisions um, in 2014 and the goal, um, well, one of the goals they had was to simplify the quality evaluation process and so these are some of the things that we'll be talking about in this particular webinar. Um, the TEC also formed a sector reference group which operationalised the cabinet decisions and made some further changes as well. A lot of these were based on recommendations from the peer review panels um, from their side. So it is important to note that all of these changes were made in consultation with the sector. Um, so to look at some of the relevant changes to EPs, so we do have the maximum number of other research outputs. So this was reduced from 30 down to 12 and that was a cabinet decision. So um, all we've done here is simply um, make that, that change. Uh, the research contribution component um, was um, merges and replaces the peer esteem and contribution to research environment components that were in EPs um, previously. So this again was another cabinet decision um, and the, um, that part of that decision was reducing the total number of entries, so from 60 across those two components down to 15 for the new research contribution component. Um, and one of the additional um, goals that cabinet had was to, that the guidelines would be more explicit about esteem and contributions from outside academia um, to ensure that those could be included in this component. Um, so in that change also led the sector reference group to introduce two, two new types um, of research contribution. So these were focused uh, more on the community and end user impact of the research. Okay, thanks Amber. And more changes? Yes, the changes never end. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the extraordinary circumstances provision um, replaced uh, special circumstances. Um, the cabinet decision here required TC to tighten the previous provision. So um, in 2006, 60% um, of EPs had special circumstances and that um, reduced down to 37% of EPs with special circumstances for 2012. Um, so what the sector reference group changes um, aimed to do was to provide a clear signal that extraordinary, extraordinary circumstances um, are only those that are uncommon and unexpected and ensures that the researchers who actually have experienced um, these ex extraordinary circumstances were um, able to clearly identify those and have those circumstances considered as part of their EP assessment. Um, but however, we will go into more detail on this particular aspect a little bit later in the webinar. Okay, and the platform of research. Ah, yes. Now this was a sector reference group uh, decision um, and it was um, sort of primarily led by feedback from um, previous panel members. So this section used to be uh, called other comments in the evidence portfolio and it used to sit underneath the researcher details section of an evidence portfolio. So it was almost sort of tucked away. Um, and the reason that this has been sort of lifted up and, and changed um, was that panel members said that this, when it was done well, the section was done well, that it was extremely useful um, and however it wasn't always completed um, the same way by um, all different organisations, different researchers, so it can be really beneficial. So right. it's been lifted up. Okay. And the third one? Yeah, so the third one um, again was a, um, a cabinet decision was to investigate um, the addition of a new peer review panel which is the Pacific Research Panel and so the TC consulted on that and received a wide level of support from across the sector and so we have 13 panels for the 2018 quality evaluation. Mm. Right, thank you. All right, so going back, so an EP, the big picture. <clears throat> so an EP essentially is a snapshot of the staff member's research in that six year assessment period. Um, it tells a story, shows a clear and cohesive story of, the, of their research 
activities and outputs. It allows the staff member to, to explain and evidence any extraordinary circumstances that have affected the quantity of their research over the six-year period. And it will be assigned to one peer review panel. And that's um, the, the TEO nominates that panel. It might be cross-referenced by a chair. We'll talk a little bit about that later. But each EP has, is the responsibility of one panel. Okay, so just yeah, just um, going back, so just telling the story, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but this is where the contextual summary comes in. It's, it's about telling a clear and cohesive story. Okay, so that, that um, screen that you see up there now, that, that's a screenshot from the um, evidence portfolio Template. template, yeah. yeah. And so what we've done is just put those into each of the slides. And, and just in case you're not aware of that, it's up on our Google site. If you look under um, submitting, submitting the data tab, that's all there. Okay. So the first bit here, we're talking about um, <clears throat> the researcher details. Okay. The purpose here, of course, is we want to ensure that we can identify researchers correctly. It assists with the audit process. Um, I it's identifies any potential conflicts of interest as well and there's also um, a section here which will flag which flags confidential research so it's really important to ensure that this is all completed accurately and completely okay so just flagging confidential research it needs to be done at the at that top EP level in the EP detail section and then there's also a flag that is checked on each NRO so that's important to know um, the national student number, the NSN, each, each researcher needs one. Um, it might be that uh, they're not sure of what it, what it is. But the, each TO will have a, somebody who's in charge of those um, numbers and so that they need to go on there. Date of birth um, should be accurate and if it's not known, it's possible to use a default, but we, it would be great to have them all accurate. Um, no. Ethnicity, so ethnicity, sorry, that's recorded on the staff data file, but again, um, it's great if we can get the accurate data in because we're collecting this, uh, this fantastic data and so in the interests of valid and accurate data for future research, um, it'd be great if everybody could make sure that those, um, that demographic information is correct. Okay, <clears throat> choosing the panel very important. And here's another screenshot, okay. The purpose here of course is to ensure that the right panel is looking at the EP. Um, each, P, each EP must nominate a panel and a PDRF subject area. <coughs> so this is the best fit for the majority of the research outputs, particularly the, the NROs, the nominated research outputs. Um, important to remember that with the exception of the Māori Knowledge and Development Panel and the Pacific Research Panels, TEOs ca cannot request a cross-reference. So th this is different from last time. <coughs> All right, the coverage of panels, um, they're each assigned specific subject areas out of the 43, and the panel-specific guidelines, which are really good, and they're also up on our website and, and on our lovely Google site, they have lots of detail and information about each panel and what they're looking for. <coughs> Okay, here's a question about panels. I'll throw this one at you, Amber. So you. Um, what, if the, what if the researcher's work doesn't clearly fit with a subject area? Is there any advice you can give or what happens? Yep. So I think in these cases um, it's important that um, you know, the TO works with the staff member to look at um, what the research that they are submitting um, actually contains. And then um, in some cases it might be difficult uh, to clearly identify with um, a subject area. Or, um, but, you know, one of the examples that we had come in, um, the staff member needed to have a sort of second look at what the underlying methodology was in their research. Um, so this might help. Um, however, you know, it is an area where the panel's expertise and judgment um, can have an, an impact. And so um, in those cases, panels may transfer an EP to a different panel if they think that it is, like, is out of their remit. Okay. But people can be reassured that their EP is going to go to the right experts. Definitely, yeah. definitely, yeah. 
Um, but we just had, hi Kirsten, Kirsten has just asked um, what website are you talking about, the web address. That's our Google website. I won't read it out now because no one will remember it, it's quite long, but it's going to, you'll see it at the end of this um, of this presentation and I'll, I'll, I'll send it out with my follow-up email too. But it's where we're keeping all our stuff now, we've got newsletters and all your questions go on there, it's fabulous, bit of self-promotion there. <laughs> anyway, but we'll put that link up at the end. Yes, and also, hi Hafsa, um, you have uh, just asking, can I look at this, the recording of this webinar? And definitely, we will be recording it and put a, putting the recording up onto our Google site as well, within, I'd say, a couple of days after this is done. Okay, so the previous webinar is there. Yes, it is. Thanks, Blair. Yeah, so our first webinar, which was about staff eligibility, and you might not have um, attended that, that's there as well. And they come up really nicely. They recorded well, and you can... Um, hear everything and see everything. Great, you're welcome. <laughs> okay, what were we doing? Question on panels. <clears throat> oh, Amber, okay, yep. another question for you. <clears throat> so <clears throat> why would a panel move an EP to another panel? Like, do they have too many and they can't cope? So, no, there's, uh, the panels don't have any limit on the number of EPs that they'll accept. Um, a panel chair might decide to transfer an EP if the research is out of their remit, as I mentioned um, before. Um, usually when this happens, um, it's a, a request that comes through to the TEC and um, the two chairs, usually it's um, one, you know, one panel transferring to the other panel, uh, we make sure that they've had that discussion, that they agree that, um, that that's where the best fit is, and then the TEC actually um, makes that action happen. Um, there's some more information on it, um, the actual process in the assessment guidelines. Um, and I think it's probably you know, a timely reminder that, um, don't forget, we will be asking all TEOs in February next year um, for estimates on the number of EPs and the subject areas they think these will be in. Um, and what this is for is to actually help our panel chairs finalise the total size of their panels so mm. that we can try and make sure that there's not a huge workload on our panels. <coughs> okay. Yes. And uh, just a question that's come in and it's very related to what we're talking about now. So someone has asked, um, what if a staff member's qualifications are in one subject area, uh, the research is in another? Um, so we don't actually <coughs> um, collect any information on a staff member's qualifications. So um, it's the research that they're submitting that is the most important thing there. Yeah. Okay, and this another related question here. This is one we prepared earlier. So what if an EP has research outputs which are equally split across two subject areas? Yeah. So in this case, the TEO needs to make the decision with the researcher about where that panel goes. So they do need to um, make sure that this is clearly identified in the evidence portfolio. Um, and Sharon, I think that actually brings us quite nicely into our next topic. Yeah. It does. <laughs> um, Lisa's asked something about... Oh, we won't come back to you on that one, Lisa. And we might need a little bit of clarification. <clears throat> okay, so moving on. So the field of research description. Okay, um, the purpose of this is to assist the chair with assignment within the panel. So the chair's going to have a bunch of experts and he or she will use that to decide who's the best expert to look at this particular piece of research, or it also might indicate to the chair that it needs to go outside the panel to another one. So um, this should be a brief narrative description of your work, a short example, so um, it, it's, we're talking about discipline or sub-discipline level information, clearly describing the research, and if it's relevant, any key areas of interdisciplinary research. Okay, so here's an example of a sort of what a brief narrative description might look like. I just took this from the guidelines. Here it is, quote, cross-cultural management and leadership, unquote, or, quote, history and theory of cinema and theatre, unquote. Okay, it's only 200 characters. Keep it short and snappy and informative. Um, as I said, longer statements should only be used where necessary, for example, where the NROs are interdisciplinary, or they sit in different subject areas. So here's an example of maybe an, an one that, that 
uh, straddles a couple of disciplines. Quote, this research is interdisciplinary. The research in two NROs relates to veterinary microbiology and public health, while the research in the third NRO relates to public policy and environmental management. There's a bit of a, a, bit of a spread there, but that's, <laughs> you get the idea. <clears throat> Okay, so just to let you know folks, um, we have, we've got a few questions coming in now which is fabulous. Um, we, we'll hold off and work through what we're doing and we'll come back to you like we did last time um, and have a, have a session there where we answer them. And if we don't, it means that we think it's better answered offline. But as I said before, you'll all be party to any answers that go out regardless. <clears throat> Okay, <clears throat> Māori research and or Pacific research elements. Okay, so the purpose of this part of the EP is to flag to the relevant chair or chairs and allow them to decide whether cross-referral assessment will occur or not. So this, this is when, um, if an EP is not going to one of these panels, but it does contain research that is relevant to that panel. So to give you an example here, an EP might be nominated to go to medicine and public health, but it contains a research output which meets the remit of the Māori Knowledge and Development Panel. So completing this field makes the EP then accessible to the Māori Knowledge and Development Chair automatically during the assignment process. Mm. Okay, um, now if the Māori, I'm just going to go MKD panel, it's selected as the primary assessment panel, you don't complete this Māori research element. And if the same goes if you were doing, if the Pacific research panel was selected as the primary assessment panel, you don't complete it, if you see what I mean. So it's, it's if it's going to another nominated panel, but you want to say, hey, wait a minute, this research also pertains to something related to Pacific research or Māori knowledge research. <coughs> Okay, um, Amber, a question for you. Can TEOs request cross-referrals to other panels? No. Um, so as we mentioned previously, this was another cabinet decision. Um, but the primary panel chair can request a cross-referral. And this is why it is so important to give a brief but accurate description of the field of research. Um, and it may be um, appropriate to also touch on it in the platform of research contextual summary section. Okay, which is um, what we're going to talk about now. Yes, okay, the platform of research contextual summary. Essentially, this is, you'll see it says contextual narrative, okay, and it is a narrative, it's a story, and like any good story, just make sure it connects up nicely and it doesn't leave out any of the good bits. Okay, it's not just an ad hoc collection of outputs here. So it should explain the research environment and the context. This is this is the opportunity to tell the story of the context that this is this sits in and how it all relates to it within itself. Okay, um, any changes in the field or the researchers' field or focused should be added here because that could also affect or maybe have reduced any elements of esteem. <coughs> Okay, um, for, a, for a closer look at this, it's, uh, we would say go back to the TEO guidelines and have a good read of the part on plat platform of research <coughs> contextual summary. Amber, is there anything you wanted to add there? Yeah, I think um, it's, it is important to note that the platform of research contextual summary um, it gives the researcher an opportunity to um, provide some of that information about their specific research context, but, um, which is important considering the reduction in the size of um, an evidence portfolio, so from 30 OROs down to 12, from 60 um, esteemed contribution items down to 12 that cover esteemed contribution and um, end user impact. Um, so, that information can help contextualise, um, you know, potentially what, um, you know, why certain outputs or um, activities have been included. So, um, for example, um, you know, they, um, if someone's working in a more applied research field, um, there might be a larger number of confidential outputs or patents, for example, and that might just help introduce the panel 
um, to the EP so that you know so that's pulling the whole thing together really. Mm -hmm. um, and as you mentioned already, um, you know if. Um, if there has been a change in the research focus, um, again, that might explain why, um, you know, if an established researcher is now working in a new or unrelated field, um, there might be um, fewer or potentially different esteem entries than what someone might expect. Mm. So it's definitely um, to people's advantage to tell, to say this stuff. And yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's right. And mm. and I mean, I think the other aspect of it is, um, you know, employment status has come up um, quite a lot over the consultation process with with the sector, um, and the information might contextualise a difference in what someone's reported FTE shows in the EP, which is just that FTE for the one year. Um, when compared to potentially the FTE over the six-year assessment period, or there might be some other duties which are, might be relevant to the researcher's context. So it just puts the whole portfolio into the right context for the panel to um, to not be looking through it and going, why why is that there? Or <laughs> I don't understand what you know why this has been selected or those kind of things. And I think it's also good to um, for TOs to remind their researchers to you know have a look at the panel specific guidelines um, if, to see if there are any um, panel specific um, information on completing this section because each panel may you know have identified a, you know what it is that they, they're kind of trying to look for right. when they see this. Okay. <clears throat> Yes, they, that is a very valuable document. So the panel specific guidelines uh, um, have a lot of very useful stuff. Okay, and just a quick question, Amber, on that's coming on this. To, if I'm part time, is that where it goes? The contextual summary? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this can um, go in the contextual summary. Um, as I said, the EP uh, will show the FTE that's reported through the staff data file, but as I said before, it's not necessarily the FTE for the entire assessment period. Um, and you know, it is um, you know also important to remember that a fractional FTE might not um, have any effect on on the portfolio as well. Someone could be a fractional FTE at um, at a TEO, but actually the other remainder of their their role is at a in a research role outside of a TEO. So um, you know, so it's not an you know just because you're part time doesn't mean that you have to put that in there. Um, and so it's really, I think, my advice to TEOs um, when they're talking to their staff about this would be, um, you know. Is this information sort of does it add value to the researcher's assessment, um, you know, or is there other information that would actually be better? Because um, I guess there's only so many characters um, yeah. in this <laughs> section. Yeah. Okay. Thank. Thank you. Okay. Now let's move on. So that's the, that's all the things that sit at the beginning, and now we're getting into the meat and the sandwich, the research outputs. All right. <clears throat> So we have the NROs, the nominated research outputs, that's the really good stuff. Um, there must be at least one and there no more than four. And they they must meet all three eligibility criteria, which we'll talk about in just one sec. We've also got the OROs, that's the other research output, which is the other but still good stuff. So we could say the good and the gooder. If there are four NROs, you can have up to 12 OROs. But if you've got less than four NROs, don't know, you won't have any. So hopefully that's clear. If you're not sure, go back to the to the TEO guidelines. Okay, and these also have to meet all three of the eligibility criteria, which is, okay, it meets the PBRF definition of research, and I'll just go through that in a minute. The final version was first made publicly available between the 1st of Jan 2012 and 31st of December 2017. <clears throat> the final version made available, that's published, performed, exhibited. <clears throat> um, NROs, so that the NROs, the actual research output can be submitted for assessment and audited. OROs, audited. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so the definition of research, and again, this is from our <clears throat> from our guidelines. I've just this is not the full definition. I've just taken the the main bit, I suppose. So it's original, independent investigation undertaken to contribute to knowledge and understanding, and in some 
in the case of some disciplines, cultural innovation or aesthetic refinement. Okay, so this has to be met all by all um, research outputs. Okay, um, the, the research findings must be open to scrutiny or formal evaluation by experts within the field. Um, just to a note here too, that, that use of the word independent there, that, that's not excluding collaborative work, that's not what it means. <clears throat> okay, just and just a brief, just briefly touching on what research is not, according to our definitions, and, it, and it's not routine testing, data collection, teaching preparation, for example. Now, I haven't gone fully into the definition there, that's just to give you an, an overview, but please go back and have a look at the guidelines to really um, get your head around that. Okay, so a question. No, not a question. Blair's going to tell us something now. <laughs> uh, the, the, the issue here is eligibility dates. That's right. So uh, from an audit perspective, this is one of the areas that uh, we put the most attention on. And the guidelines here haven't changed from 2012. It's, it's still the same. It's the date the final version first appeared in the public domain. Um, there's plenty of examples in the guidelines that will help you there um, on, on both sort of sides of the, of the assessment period. Now, if an output was pre-published before the 1st of January 2012, but has an imprint date within the period, it's not eligible. It's all about when it was first publicly available. Mm -hmm. And the opposite is the same. So if it was first publicly available within the period, but it happens to have an imprint day that would date that was earlier or later than the assessment period, it can go in. Okay. Now, for traditional outputs, it's a, it's a lot more straightforward, and we recommend you use the uh, National Information Standards Organization definitions to check you've got the right eligibility details. And this is an area that your libraries uh, or information management teams will be able to help you with. Right. <clears throat> now, for the non-traditional outputs, it's a little bit different. So exhibitions, performances, etc. Once again, it's got to be when it was first publicly available. And often these performances are repeated multiple times through the period. And if that's the case, you can choose the most prestigious one rather than the first. Mm -hmm. But the first does still have to be within the assessment period. All right. Um, and here's another question. I'll ask this one of you, Blair, too. So it's talking about um, reprints. So if a journal article was published before 2012 in one journal and then published again in a sort of very best of special edition, um, but it wasn't submitted in the last round and the journal citation will be within this period, is that eligible? No, the share it's not uh, because it was first published before 2012. But it's not all bad news. Uh -huh. uh, this can be claimed in the research contributions component. Uh, there's a category called recognition of research outputs, and this might be a good place to put this here. Last time we had a, an interesting example in this area where we had uh, some musical works that were first released on, on an LP or, or record, and then uh, well before the assessment period, and then republished on CD within the assessment period. In that circumstance, it's not eligible because the, the output was first available. Right. Or, Okay, that's that's good to know. Thanks, Blair. <clears throat> okay, let's talk for a minute about assessing and auditing research outputs. So that as as we said, all research outputs will be audited, but only NROs, nominated research outputs, are uh, submitted for assessment. <clears throat> okay, um, <clears throat> and OROs provide evidence of, cost of the wider platform of research. Remember that the guidelines do contain much more comprehensive descriptions of what to consider for each um, research output type and um, corresponding information about evidence for um, audit and for assessment. So there's lots of stuff in the guidelines and it's really clearly set out and um, yeah, it's all there essentially and we can't of course go into that today. <clears throat> Amber, you wanted to say something though? Yeah, I think um, there's just one sort of small point which is that um, for NROs we've, um, we've made a change to the format of, um, of evidence supplied um, within the EP. So now um, it's really important that um, the actual research output which is submitted as the NRO um, gets listed as the main research out, um, object. And that's um, you know what you know what a 
panel member would expect to see, you know, if it was um, if it was something that um, is described as a film, they would expect to see a film. If mm -hmm. it's described as a journal article, they'll expect to see a journal article. Um, and so basically, it's really important that um, that that main research object allows the panel to make a fair assessment of the quality of that particular output. Um, so it's not evidence that it exists or some other evidence that might um, only be a sort of possible proxy for quality, um, like the publication outlet or um, citation. So it is really mm -hmm. important. Um, other information um, can be submitted under the section that's called supporting information. Um, and that's the kind of thing that may also be required for the audit of the output if um, there's, there's information um, that's not on the main research output. So for example, it might be a, um, a chapter in a book might get submitted as the main research object, but if that doesn't have all of the um, bibliographic details, for example, then um, an additional page or, um, or document might need to be submitted and as supporting information. And, um, and I think that, um, another question popped up from um, Adrian there, which was around um, the actual um, ORO um, is to be audited. So the guidelines do say that. That doesn't mean that we will expect you to produce every um, ORO um, as part of the audit process, so if I'm <laughs> correct there, uh, Blair. Yeah, that's right. If we can find publicly available information to support it in the first instance, that's what we're doing. And only a very small fraction, probably 5 to 10 percent, are actually sought from the TEO. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, types of research outputs. So they've been condensed from um, 31 types down to 15 types. Um, and there are descriptions for each type. If you go to the guidelines, again, there's really good descriptions of what's included and what's not included. Um, and just a note, the, the, there was a lot of sector consultation on this, so we wanted to send a thank you to everybody who worked on that, giving their feedback. Um, so you'd need to classify your research outputs accordingly. And just to note, there's no weighting. Okay, so we sometimes get asked, you know, is a journal better than a eh, whatever? No, nothing's considered to be more important than anything else. Yeah, I think that is a really key point for TEOs to also stress with their um, with their researchers um, and staff members is that each output is judged on its merit. On its own merits. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Okay, a question for you, Amber. Um, I've got a research output type and it's not mentioned in the panel specific guidelines. Can I still submit it? Well, if it does meet all of the eligibility criteria, then yes. So the RO descriptions are not um, considered exhaustive. There's always something that might pop out. Um, but um, it does provide the guidance on the types and there's always the category of um, other research outputs. Um, for you know some of those ones that might be a little bit trickier to um, to clearly identify. Okay, great. And another one on research types. So how do we select the research outputs that will be viewed as the highest quality? It's kind of related to what we just said, really. So do you know do panels prefer to see a journal paper with an impact factor of less than one rather than an A-ranked conference paper? I think we've kind of just answered that, really, haven't we? Just yeah, yeah. And I think again, it's it's coming back to the fact that this is a quality evaluation, and um, you know that's why you are asked to submit the actual research output so that panels can make that judgment um, on the quality of the actual research, um, not the channel, um, and not using proxies. Um, so you know, I think it is really important that. You know that it is stressed. It's it's an assessment of quality on you know on the merits of their individual outputs. Um, most of the panels have provided guidance in their panel specific guidelines about the types of research outputs they would expect to see as well, um, and that can include um, that will include where there's non typical sort of research um, outputs for their particular subject area. Um, so again, I think you know I I don't think I can sort of stress it enough um, over my time of being involved in the PBRF. You know the message of you know quality and merit rather than using say you know metrics as a proxy for quality. Mm. Um, it's a good message to um, for you to talk to your staff about, remind them about, um, steer them to the PBRF um, staff guide where we've um, listed a bunch of myths. And if you keep hearing myths. Um, or you know things that um, you know common you know 
amongst um, your staff. Send them through to us because we will publish them um, in the yes. staff guide. We'll have our own Mythbusters myth yeah. webinar next time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so moving along now to quality assurance. Okay, so um, your research outputs need to be marked as, as quality assured or not. And they can both be, both types can be submitted. Um, the quality assurance should have been completed before the final version is made public. And of course, processes will be different in different disciplines. Okay, so what we, when we're saying it's not QA, we're saying it's not been subject to any kind of QA process, or it's currently in the process of being QA'd, or it was QA'd but it wasn't successful. And in that case, if it might be more it's likely to be or possibly had, would undergo more closer scrutiny by the panel. Okay, and um, what does QA mean here? Well, it might be peer review or referring process undertaken by journals or book reviewers. Um, it could be other review processes. There's a lot of other examples. And again, so go back to the guidelines. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to, um, we are zipping through now because lots of stuff to get through here. Um, joint research. All right. Okay, this is um, the purpose here in, of this part of, there's a, a, a sort of, there's a section on the EP where a researcher needs to complete their individual contribution and that's the purpose of that is to flag what their contribution has been. <clears throat> um, it, it, this should talk about the nature and not the percentage or it should talk about the significance of the contribution. Um, also note the distinction between co-authorship, that's where somebody's written something, and co-production where they have produced something in a, in, a, in a collective way. So that might be more like an artistic work, an exhibition and film and so on. Remember that the, um, the quality evaluation assesses the work of individuals, whether or not they are the sole contributor. <clears throat> yes. Um, a question on joint research. If there are several contributors um, to a piece of research, can we all put it in our EPs? Yes, um, that's perfectly fine and that happens all the time. Um, so um, that's pretty standard practice. I guess um, our message would be to um, to make sure that, um, you know, that people do have, um, you know, a conversation and make sure that the contributions line up so, you know, that everyone's story is straight about who did what. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, research, the research contribution part now. So this um, comprises 30% of the EP score. It can be up to 15 items. They need to be categorised. There are 12 types and they must be within the assessment period. Next slide. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. So yes, the purpose of this is to describe the contribution and recognition of the staff members' research and their related activities. And again, um, no type of research contribution is more important or weighted than any others. They're all considered. Um, the, the panel specific guidelines may provide further examples of discipline specific um, research related activities and outcomes. <coughs> um, the order of assessment, they should be grouped together so that they make sense. Now, not all 12 types are required, but for a high score, panels would expect to see um, both esteem and contribution examples, and ideally also should be included community and or user end impact as, as research contribution types. End user, not end user, user end. Sorry, did I say? <laughs> <laughs> All right, question on that. Uh, Blair, so how will the research contributions be audited? Yeah, our process here is pretty simple really. So uh, as soon as possible after the, the data's in, we'll send out to you the sample of research contributions that we're wanting to look at. We recognise you may not have collected these in advance, so that gives you a chance to talk to your researchers and collect any evidence. Our next step is we will look, for, look for, to find uh, publicly available information for as many as possible of these uh, from public sources, and we'll only come back to you where we've got a query about a major discrepancy uh, where perhaps there's no evidence to suggest one of the items exists, and then we'd ask for you to send it through to us. Okay, thank you. And one for you, Amber, what level of information is required to assess the research contribution? Yeah, so I, I guess the focus here is really um, that there is a comprehensive dis 
description of the nature and significance of the item. Um, and I think that um, it's you know particularly important um, where people are including examples of impact outside of academia um, to understand the reach of that impact. So you know, uh, looking at the end user, how um, you know what's that reach been, and you know into that um, into that target group. Um, so I guess the other thing is really that it has to you know have sufficient information and evidence, um, and so making sure that um, also something like um, the prestige. Um, of an, a research activity, um, it allows uh, the panel to actually make that um, sort of judgment between the different tie point descriptors. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Amber. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is extraordinary circumstances. Um, there's a little clip from your um, EP template. <clears throat> okay, so really. Um, this is a change from last time. Um, as we said, it's replaced, re replaced special circumstances, and it's talking. The most important, one of the most important things to realise here is that it's, it's about how any extraordinary circumstances may have affected the quantity of research and not the quality. They must have occurred over a three-year period, but not doesn't have to be continuous. There are two types: general and Canterbury, and you can, one or both can be claimed. And the TO, it's down to the TO to determine if that claim is eligible. Um, just note again, and this is now scored at the holistic and not the preparatory score stage of the um, assessment. Okay, Amber, you're going to talk briefly about yeah. ordinary circumstances. Yeah, so, um, so as Sharon's already mentioned, um, both the Canterbury and the general extraordinary circumstances need to um, have um, happened over a three year period. Um, so, and then um, the specific uh, type needs to be identified in the EP. So for general, there are the three types. So long term illness or disability, extended personal leave or significant family or community responsibilities. Um, now I think it's, um, there's obviously a more detailed um, description of those in the guidelines which um, which will you know, provide you with a little bit more information there. But I think um, one of the things that is worth noting is that, um, that the sector reference group did actually give consideration to the prohibited grounds for discrimination that are set out in the Human Rights Act when these three um, types were actually chosen. Um, and so um, that's why you know, these three um, are, the, are the key ones for that. Um, one, more than one type can also be selected um, and you know because we understand that there are um, you know, often things that are interlinked. Um, and also um, I think this is where um, part-time um, um, can also be mentioned if, if it's also a factor as one of these and I think that's mm. one of the things. But not, should, not by itself. But right? not on its own, no. yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then there are five impact types that um, can be identified under the Canterbury Extraordinary Circumstance um, provision. So multiple impacts can be selected because we, again, it's the same thing. A lot of these are all interlinked. Um, and obviously there is a far more sort of descriptive, um, you know, um, you know, or level of detail in, in those descriptions um, in the main guidelines. Right. So. With the description of the extraordinary circumstances, um, each of you know, the other types, um, be it um, general or Canterbury, has got a description section. And I think it's really important that staff understand that the focus should be on the impact um, of the circumstances rather than actually detailing what those circumstances are. Um, and so there needs to be sufficient detail for the panel to make a jump judgment on the impact of the quantity. But um, it was it is really important that, um, that 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 focus is on the impact on a person's research outputs or research activities because of the circumstance. Mm -hmm. So um, a, a large description on the circumstance doesn't actually explain to the panel about what you know, it what means, that, um, yeah, means exactly for the what that impact on the quantity has been. And um, so it's important that um, the TEOs 
validate the circumstance. So only you know, a relatively brief explanation would be required because it, the process ensures that, um, that, you know, that the TEO makes the judgement on whether that's a valid circumstance to be submitted. Okay, so a question. If, if somebody claims General and Canterbury, do both have to have occurred over a minimum period of three years during the assessment period? No. So um, the circumstance um, can be a combination of both of those and then together they meet that um, minimum period of three years. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one for you, Blair. What kind of evidence would be required for extraordinary circumstances? Yeah, we'll be covering this off a little bit this year um, and looking at the, we really want to see the process that TEOs have put in place to, to ensure that the extraordinary circumstances are genuine and are extraordinary. There's been a few rules that relate to this that we've talked through today and we want to know how you are going to validate those with your staff. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and Amber, does it need to have taken place across three years? Like a, a serious occurrence just might span just one year and can be also significant. Um, yes, it does have to have taken place um, across the three years. So um, we do recognise that obviously there can be um, other things that can happen to people in life because that's just what mm. um, you know what happens. Um, but unfortunately, this is the rule that's been set in place, and um, and there are no exceptions. Okay. All right. Thank you. So back to the big picture. We started off talking about big picture, and we now we've moved through the various parts of the EP that make that make it up. And let's just head head back to the big picture and have a little look very briefly at, at the scoring. Okay. So the question that a researcher would need to ask, or that TEO needs to ask the researcher, does this does this show the researcher's best research? Does it tell the research story clearly and cohesively? And does it reflect the standards set out in the scoring descriptors and follow any panel specific specific panel advice? So let's have a wee peek now at those descriptors. Okay. <clears throat> So the quality category descriptors, um, there are a, there's a specific descriptor for each. You need to see the assessment guidelines for these, not the TO ones, but the assessment ones. Um, and each descriptor has sort of key characteristics. So for example, an A would show evidence of research outputs being a world-class standard, while a B shows evidence of research outputs of high quality, and a C, quality assured research outputs. <coughs> okay, just a note that <coughs> in this particular example here, the use of world-class is not, we're not talking here about um, I do know it's a standard, it's not a type. So when we say world-class research outputs are those that rank with the best within their broader discipline, regardless of the theme or the topic or the location. <clears throat> or the place of publication, which I think is particularly key. There, often um, the idea of world-class means um, published in international journals, hmm. and that's, um, that's not the case. This is a standard. Right. Can a new and emerging researcher get an A? Yes, they can. <laughs> so um, we do, this question has come up a few times and um, and so um, a new and emerging researcher can get an A, they can get a B. They just have to meet the same standard as anybody else who um, for an A and a B, again it's a standards based assessment. Um, the only difference for a new and emerging researcher really is around that C and E quality category and that's where the allowance is given for um, uh, little or no uh, research contributions within the assessment period. So okay. that's the only difference there. Could you just talk us very briefly through the, how the scoring works, Amber? Oh, we could have a whole other 20 oh, webinars on this. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so basically um, the research contribution, uh, the research output component is the 70% of your grade, so that's where the um, biggest weighting of the score is. Um, the research contribution makes up the remaining 30. Um, both of the components get scored from um, on a 0 to 7 scale by the peer review panel and there are tie points at um, 2, 4 and 6 and in the assessment guidelines that's where you find the tie point descriptors and these um, uh, you know, also quite important when um, researchers are looking at developing their portfolio. So, um, you know, we do recommend that, um, you know, as people administering this process, that um, that you send researchers back to those um, to those assessment standards, and um, and try and make those connections between um, the 
component and you know in the the scoring descriptors okay and do we need to look at the panel specific guidelines yes indeed so they provide advice on specific areas um, for, for topics where they don't provide the adv specific advice um, the, the advice in the main set of guidelines is sufficient Okay, someone asked us a question, could you provide a bullet point checklist on what to think about when completing each section of an EP? Because the guidelines are fabulous, we know that, but there's so much information for an academic to wade through. Well, because we are the TC, PBRF team, your wish is granted. And we have done that for you. There's a beautiful checklist, um, and it's up on our Google site at the moment. Um, and I'll send through the link to that as well. And that's just a nice little checklist for a, for a researcher. Have I done this? Have I considered that? Is that done properly? Okay. And don't forget there's also the staff guide and there's lots of good focused information on that. All right. So we are going to just take, we know that we're coming up close to 12 o'clock and some of you probably have to go off and do things. But if you want to just sit tight for a minute or two, we'll have a quick look through the questions and see if there's things we can answer for you now. Um, okay, folks, um, we've got a, quite a few questions there, so, uh, but most of them we feel like we would like to have put a more considered answer together and we'll send them do to you or do some research. <laughs> That's what we're good at. But we've got a couple that we can answer here. The first one is um, someone's asked, should the platform of research be written in the first person? Yeah, so um, my experience was that the other comments uh, section in previous EPs was written in the first person, so um, there's no reason why this shouldn't continue. Okay, and the other question, this one, um, how much time will the TEO have to find the evidence for research contributions if, it, um, if it's going to be audited? Yeah, so we've got a consistent standard of 10 days for any requests to TEOs uh, for information, and we'll send those through to our standard point of contact at your institution. Okay, is that, is that? Are there any? Yeah. Okay, well thank you very much for attending everybody and um, we will get on to those questions and have answers to, to you as soon as we possibly can. Once again, those answers will be up on the, if you look at the, um, the question part of our Google site. Um, I just want to show you where that is. Okay, so you all know our email address by now, I think, and you can call us. We have our own 0800 number. There's our Google site as well. I'll put this down in a, a follow-up email, and then the, the audit methodology is there as well. <coughs> and just uh, don't forget we're having drop-in sessions. We can't get everywhere, but we'll be in the main centres, Auckland, Christchurch, Dunedin, Wellington, and Rotorua in August. Um, you, there'll be um, correspondence coming out about how you make an appointment to see us. That'll be, when I say us, that's the team here, including the audit team. Um, we will also be asking for your contribution on what you want to see in the final report. We're really interested to, to know how you think we might be able to make that better. Um, and so just watch the, keep, keep an eye on your inboxes for information coming up about that. And then one more thing. Um, We'll have to be running a third webinar 
in early August, 3rd of August, and that's going to be about submitting data, so the nitty gritty of the actual IT system. Yeah, I think that's um, pretty much it from us. If you have feedback, we'd love to hear it. If you've got a bright idea for a webinar that we haven't thought about, please let us know as well. And once again, uh, thank you very much for attending, and I hope you all stay warm and dry because it's not looking flash here in Wellington, I'll tell you. Okay, ka kite anō.